to let me know. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today for the um, uh, the, ca the virtual cafe series seminar, the Alive as part of the Alive National Centre for Mental Health Research Translation, which for those of you who don't know, is funded by NHMRC um, and under the Special Initiative in Mental Health Scheme. And it's a really big collaborative project. Uh, there are um, over 40 investigators, 15 universities and research institutes, um, and nine partner organisations across Australia. And it's led by Professor Vicky Palmer, who's here with us today. Um, before we start, I would obviously um, like to acknowledge um, the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. Um, and I imagine some of you might be on different land. I would like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and to extend that respect to other Indigenous people present today. And I would also like to acknowledge and recognise um, those with lived experience who are here today. Um, and, you know, stress that we would wish to speak honourably and respectfully about ongoing emotional distress, experiences of trauma and mental ill health in those that experience this and also in those that um, do the work of caring and experiences of care within this context. So I'm delighted today um, to uh, have this lecture. So uh, the title of which is Prevention is Possible, so why isn't it happening? And I'll give you a bit more um, background about Dr. Stephen Carbone, who's going to give this talk today. Um, so this is part of the work of Alive that comes under the prevention stream, which um, I co-lead with Professor George Patton, who's having an extended period of leave. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, Vicky, who is the leader of the Alive Centre, and also Monica Raniti, who is going to be the chat moderator and host and is the research fellow and works in the prevention across, across the life course research program within Alive. So Monica's here today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Carbone, who we were just discussing just before, I think I've known since about 2014. And as you can see, if you read this brief, um, piece of, uh, you know, description about his career. He's had this really diverse career, which makes him really, I think, you know, an excellent speaker today from, from being a GP and working in general practice, from working in specialist mental health services. He's also um, worked in government for Beyond Blue, for Origin, for Headspace. So he's really across, you know, multiple facets of the landscape of mental health and He's recently started uh, an organisation called Prevention United, and I know that he will tell you more about that um, as part of his talk. But yeah, I'm really delighted, Steve, to welcome you to give this talk today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So I'm assuming you can share yours. But yeah, thank you. Uh, look, thanks very much, Nikki, and uh, for that wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to um, do this presentation today. I'll to start sharing my screen as well. So just give me a moment. Well, there's a bit of a delay there. Um, I'd too like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm coming from. And that is also the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation and to pay my respects to elders uh, past and present and also to any um, First Nations people in the workshop and also to people with lived or living experience um, so just to give a brief overview of my presentation, I, I want to firstly to start with some, some basics. Uh, what is prevention? Why is it important? Um, then talk a bit about, well, is prevention possible? And if so, how? What's needed to make prevention happen? And what's holding us back? So this is possibly familiar to, to many of you. So I'll go over this fairly quickly. But, you know, uh, what's a little bit confusing is that prevention is before been defined by different groups in different ways. And one of the early approaches draws from the physical health realm and talks about three stages of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary, to which another two stages, primordial and quaternary have since been added. But to look at these three, primary prevention refers to preventing the onset or occurrence of the condition. Secondary prevention is really about preventing the progression of an established condition through early detection and prompt treatment. 
And tertiary prevention is really about preventing the impacts of a condition on an individual's functioning, quality of life and longevity. Um, and this classification system is based on this recognition that many conditions, including mental health conditions, progress through a series of stages and that you can intervene at any point in the sequence to prevent progression to the next stage. Now, this is a, a, adapted from the, the clinical staging model that's been put forward by uh, Patrick McGorry and Ian Hickey and others. And for me, primary prevention sits at the top there, you know, stopping the transition from, you know, being, being well to even having, you know, some of the early sort of syndromes or first episode conditions and the rest could be classed as secondary or tertiary prevention. But then more recently or relatively recently, there's been another classification system developed that's more specific to mental health um, uh, conditions. And that defines prevention in terms of target groups. And so universal prevention is about the whole population, uh, regardless of risk. Uh, selective prevention is about targeting individuals or, or population subgroups who are at, at somewhat increased risk of developing a particular condition. And integrated prevention is really at that pointy end where it's, it's sort of trying to support people at very high risk and, and, and in particular people that might have some early sub-threshold symptoms indicating or foreshadowing a mental health condition that they do not quite meet the diagnostic levels at the current time. But it's important to emphasize that really all of these actually types of primary prevention, because they're about preventing the onset uh, of, or the occurrence rather than preventing its progression or impact. And, and this is another thing I like to highlight because I think it's actually quite important to distinguish between prevention and early intervention, particularly in mental health parlance, because you know, under the primary, secondary, tertiary classification, primary prevention is about the preventing the onset, while early intervention is really more akin to secondary prevention in that it's about early de detection and treatment of an established condition. And then under the universal selective and indicated classification, there is this blurry line between indicated prevention and early intervention, because you know, you're talking about subtle changes in symptoms from sub-threshold to threshold. However, one, you know, indicated prevention is still about preventing the onset. And, and early intervention is still about early treatment of an established condition. So that's some of the sort of the context for action. So why is it important? So this, this borrows heavily from the work of uh, Professor Jorm. We all know the saying that prevention is better than cure. Well, it's at least as good as cure. Um, and, and why? It's because it provides numerous benefits. It, it, first of all, it reduces the need for costly and often time consuming treatment saving individuals and, and the society time and money. But importantly, it averts distress and, and uh, reduces the likelihood of psychosocial disability. But it also can save lives. You know, um, uh, a, a significant proportion of suicide is, is linked to the experience of mental ill health and mental health conditions. So by preventing the conditions, you can also then prevent uh, you know, suicide from occurring. But, but critically, prevention addresses or primary prevention addresses the limitations associated with mental health care, of which there are many. I mean, first of all, not everyone wishes to access treatment due to stigma. Um, even where, where people are accessing treatment, supply uh, demand at, at exceeds supply and workforce shortages are not that easy to fix and not everyone's keen to switch to digital approaches. Um, not everyone who accesses treatment gets the right treatment or enough treatment, um, but getting clinicians and services to adopt evidence-based practices is, is difficult. And even with the best available treatment, some people don't experience complete recovery and experience continuing problems. But the development of new treatments and service reforms is slow. And, you know, arguably there haven't been a lot of major advances in recent times. And at any rate, there does seem to be a limit to the level of disability and or premature mortality that can be averted. Now, this is an old slide from, from a paper from a Gavin Andrews some time ago, but it shows that, you know, even if we maximize uh, the number of people getting evidence-based care, we're not necessarily gonna be able to reduce uh, all the, the, the burden to, to zero. So, you know, and, and actually, when you look at the population level data over the last two decades, where we've basically really 
emphasise mental health care as, as the main, if not only, solution, it doesn't really seem to have worked. This is a graph showing total mental health expenditure in Australia over the last three decades uh, taken from AIHW data. This is per capita constant prices. And you can see that we are spending more and more on, on mental health care. Now, some might say it's not enough. It's still just 7.5% of the, the total budget, federal budget, when you know um, the burden is around 12%. However, despite that, we are seeing increases in uptake, you know, particularly of Medicare subsidised services, although it's starting to plateau a little bit, not so much of state and territory funded specialist services, which remain around, you know, one to two percent, whereas at the moment there's around 10 percent or so people accessing uh, Medicare services. But then these are graphs of the prevalence of mental ill health. Now, this is taken from Endicott and looks at K-10 scores through the national health surveys that are done every three years or so in Australia. The orange uh, line represents very high K-10 scores, usually indicative of moderate or even severe uh, mental health conditions. The blue line represents high and very high. And as we can see, you know, the trend line is, is certainly not down. And if anything, it's probably going up. Um, this is taken from the, the Global Burden of Disease uh, website. I'm not exactly sure what data they base it on, but again, you get the picture. The prevalence of depression over the last 30 years has remained relatively static, uh, likewise for, for anxiety conditions. And even more concerningly, this is the suicide, uh, you know, uh, over time, you know, the age standardised suicide rate. And really, if you look at the last 30 years, you know, it's more or less hovered between, uh, you know, 10 and 12 per 100,000 people. And the youth suicide rate is, is actually, you know, increasing, not decreasing. And that's uh, driven in part by an increase in, in young women who are taking their own lives. So this is really worrying, serious, concerning data that we're really not making inroads into some of the key metrics that we would expect to see changing if our mental health care response was, was making that, that difference, not necessarily for one individual or another, but at an aggregate population level. And so this is data from the burden of disease um, showing disability adjusted life years for various conditions. And if you look at, you know, heart disease, you know, coronary heart disease, heart attacks, there's been dramatic reductions in, you know, um, disability mortality, stroke in particular, look how far it's gone down. Whereas anxiety disorders and depression, there's barely been any change, you know, in the, in the impacts uh, of these conditions on people's lives, you know, over decades. So we're, we're really, you know, in the situation where, yes, of course, we need mental health care services. And yes, of course, we need to fund them better and expand them and improve their quality. But I doubt whether mental health care on its own is going to solve the crisis. And we need to start thinking about what else is required, what else can we do? And I think that's where prevention sort of comes into the picture. So is prevention possible? So the next part is really drawn for some evidence reviews that we undertook for Vic Health and also for the West Australia Mental Health Con Con Commission. And again, just to sort of set the scene, that there's really broadly two main approaches that can be used. One is, is about modifying the risk and protective factors that are associated with these conditions. The other is about offering intervention to individuals with those early subthreshold symptoms or emer of emerging disorders, so that indicated prevention. I, I tend to focus more on, on the, the tackling risk and protective factors, and, and, and for us that's based on the recognition that, you know, as we all know, mental health conditions arise from a very complex interplay of risk and protective factors interacting with current life events and stressors. We, we can talk about risk and protective factors in, in different ways or classify them in different ways. There are some that are unique to us, you know, whether that's ge genetic predisposition, biological predisposition, and there are those that are in our external environments that, that we share with others. You could classify them then as biological, psychological, social, cultural, economic, or about your own day-to-day -day behaviors and activities and those things that are out of your control, the social determinants of mental health. And these factors actually vary over the life course. So 
some are more prominent at some life stages than others. For example, secure attachment versus insecure attachment is obviously around infancy and, and early childhood. But things like social disadvantage, bullying, you know, they can occur at, at any age or stage. Um, the, the worrying thing is that risk factors often co-occur co and accumulate compounding disadvantage. Um, and that often follows a, an SES or socioeconomic um, social gradient. Um, some appear to be more influential than others. And we know from the burden of disease studies that childhood trauma in particular, you know, is a major, major risk factor for a wide variety of mental health conditions. Um, intimate partner violence and bullying have also been well established as causative um, of mental ill health. But the, the problem is that some are more malleable to change than others. Now, I'm not gonna go through this, but it's just to give you a feel for the, the plethora, I guess, of risk factors that have been uh, documented in cross-sectional and other studies as having some association uh, with various types of uh, mental health conditions. Um, this is uh, taken from Ferber and others, which is um, their approach to classifying these conditions. I guess what I wanna show you is how many different risk factors uh, have been um, shown to be connected with the onset of mental health conditions. And likewise, there's also quite a sizable number of protective factors that buffer or mitigate or reduce people's likelihood of experiencing a mental health condition. So from that perspective, like, like we do in health uh, care and public health and health promotion, if we're going to tackle um, risk and protective factors, we need to take that public health and, and in, in our field, what I would call a mental health promotion approach. And, and given what we know about risk and protective factors, it's critical that this approach prioritizes the pre-onset period. And given that 75% of all conditions start you know, by age 25, clearly we need to prioritize the perinatal childhood and uh, you know, youth period. We, we need to you know, get into the, the, the settings where these risk and protective factors occur. So it's about a defined population setting for action and a particular risk or protective factor. And it's not all about individual behavior change. We do need to look at how we can change environments. So that looks at structural and, and social change. And it's about focusing on groups and communities rather than individuals. So this is where the similarities with health promotion really kick in. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, based using the, the Ottawa Charter um, strategies, um, is equally applicable to, to mental health promotion and illness prevention. And it is about those, those five, um, oh, sorry, six building blocks. And so just looking at some of the evidence, because all of these have been tried in, in some shape or form, um, public education awareness and, 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 you know, this, you know, should be part of what I call a comprehensive approach to mental health literacy that includes that positive mental health literacy, as well as literacy around mental health conditions and treatments and, and, and available options. So, you know, it's important to explain mental health or mental well-being as mental ill health or mental uh, health conditions, promote mentally healthy behaviours and self-care, as well as, you know, promoting recognition of mental ill health, suicidal ideation, and of course, encouraging help seeking and help giving. Now, at the moment, there's a big skew towards the latter rather than the former. And so we've had decades of great programs like mental health first aid, you know, are you okay? And, and all the public health messaging that we've seen. But more recently, we're starting to see some, you know, positive mental health literacy emerging through, you know, organizations like Act Belong Commit, Five Ways to Wellbeing. And the top one refers to the Headspace Day um, sort of uh, focus. Now, because they're relatively new, there's there's limited evidence for prevention impacts for such campaigns, but we do know there's good evidence for illness knowledge, stigma reduction, and help seeking, or to some extent, help seeking for the other campaigns. Where the biggest emphasis has been and the most evidence is, is around skills building for individuals. And, it, and it's really two main efforts, promoting healthy behaviors, but also teaching people core critical psychological self-care skills. And these are typically drawn from health psychology, clinical psychology, in particular CBT, but also positive psychology. And, and we see many of these uh, programs 
you know, available in schools, um, in workplaces, and to some extent online. So it includes things like social emotional learning programs in schools, the ubiquitous resilience programs, uh, which obviously vary a lot in, 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 in their effectiveness, but also disorder specific programs, you know, like the good behavior game, trying to prevent um, externalizing problems, the friends resilience, uh, trying to prevent anxiety disorders. That, so there's very good evidence for, for exercise, um, the preventive benefits of exercise. I guess it's fair to say there's some evidence for healthy eating, although it's probably more around a treatment adjunct rather than the preventive benefits at this stage. But there's ample evidence to show that psychoeducation and psychological skills building programs, particularly those based on CBT, can um, reduce the likelihood um, or occurrence of, of depression and, and, and anxiety. Um, so then parenting programs are another big part of what's on offer. These take various forms from screening for perinatal mental health conditions, which is obviously early intervention when it comes to the parents, but it has preventive benefits for children because parental mental ill health is obviously a risk factor for child um, mental health conditions. Home visiting programs to prevent child maltreatment and then the flow on benefits around preventing uh, mental ill health. But those more, you know, organized, structured uh, parenting programs that look at positive parenting skills. And again, there's very good evidence for a lot of these, um, you know, particularly around externalizing conditions, but also more recently around internalizing. There's obviously also a big focus on social support and social connection. Um, you know, loneliness is a major risk factor. So there's this emphasis on trying to promote um, opportunities for people to either build their social skills to feel more confident in social interactions, but offer them those opportunities to connect with others, whether it's one-to-one -one or in group situations. I'm not a sort of you know, specialist in this area, but my understanding is there's mixed evidence. There's some programs that do seem to work well, particularly for older people, but, but not, you know, there's no surefire um, you know, uh, way to, to be able to prevent loneliness. And plus, even when we prevent loneliness, there's not always studies to show that then that leads to the prevention of, of mental health conditions like depression. So we need more work there. Creating mentally healthy environments, well, that's things like mental health promoting schools, university wellbeing frameworks, workplace mental wellbeing. And again, I, I, I would say that there's some good emerging evidence rather than you know, saying that, uh, that we have, again, surefire ways, but it, there's, there's obviously tantalizing suggestions that being able to influence the, the culture, the ethos, the policies of an organization can actually have flow on benefits for people's mental health and well-being. Um, and then in terms of strengthening community action, so these are place-based community mobilization initiatives, things like communities that care, um, you know, some target um, AOD harm, some target suicide prevention. I guess CTC is the one that I think has the most evidence of, of, of being able to prevent numerous different things from alcohol harm, substance use, offending behaviour, injury, but also su some suggestion that it can reduce depressive symptoms. So there's a lot of interest in these place-based solutions. And I think um, definitely for suicide prevention, Black Dog Institute and Every Mind, the, the lifespan study is also showing a lot of promise. So definitely would consider them in the mix. And then of course, it's, it's not all about programs. It also is about policies like we do in, in public health for the prevention of obesity or alcohol. Um, we need to get into regulation. We need to get into legislation. Some of the changes that we know are gonna create better environments for people, whether that's you know tackling things like access to high quality education, employment, income adequacy, or dealing with things like gender inequality, um, gendered violence, racism, homophobia, transphobia. The problem that we have is that these things are hard to research and it's very hard to then draw a line between the intervention and the prevention of that risk factor and then of, of the particular condition that's connected to that risk factor. But clearly given their significance, it's an area worth pursuing. I'll go into this very briefly, but you know there are the other way is around indicated prevention, and that's about you know recognizing people at imminent risk through screening and other mechanisms, 
but and then offering some form of therapeutic response. And um, the advantages of this compared to the other um, approach is that it's more targeted. You, you're really focusing on the people that are most likely to obtain benefits. And you know, often the effect size for indicated prevention is greater than for universal. Um, and you can do it in various ways that are non-stigmatizing. For example, we know insomnia is connected to certain conditions. So you can target insomnia and that may have flow on benefits for preventing depression, but people are just going for a sleeping intervention, which they're happy to do rather than for a depression intervention, which they may not be happy to do. The big disadvantages are screening is difficult. Just because you've got symptoms doesn't mean you're gonna to progress to the condition. There's worries about labeling, you know, the, the, the stress that causes and potentially unnecessary treatment. But the other big disadvantage, from my opinion, is that it directs people to clinical services and they're already under stress. And so we're just increasing demand for services and maybe it, it then puts pressure on uh, availability for others. It's been trialed for various conditions, depression in particular, indicated prevention. You know, um, some studies, uh, meta-analysis showed that 20% reduction in new onset cases um, for indicated prevention. But then, you know, there's a concern that very few people are using these modalities um, you know, so they're not, not attracting the people that can benefit. Um, psychosis, well, look, I think, again, the evidence is mixed. There seems to be some success in identifying people at high risk. Various interventions have been trialled. Probably the most effective tend to be psychological strategies. But again, this is still in the specialist re uh, research realm rather than the real world setting. So what do we need to make prevention happen on a sustainable effective footing? Well, two main things. Of course, effective interventions for different con uh, conditions, that's, that's a given. But it's also about the infrastructure um, that allows us to deliver these programs to a high quality and to a high reach at a national scale. Breadth and scale and quality is crucial, particularly if you're trying to tackle risk and protective factors, because we're trying to tackle multiple factors across the whole population. Now, as I alluded to, in physical health, we have a clearly distinct health promotion, public health system, and a, a healthcare system. And they integrate, but they focus and do slightly different things. But in mental health, I would argue, we only have a mental health care system, however imperfect, but we don't really have a mental health promotion system, by which I mean a system focused on wellbeing and prevention. And I think we need to expand our approach and and create a mental health promotion system to complement our mental health care system. So when you look at the continuum, uh, action continuum or the intervention continuum, we sort of got the stuff to the right of screen, but not so much to the left of screen. And we really need to understand that they're very different ways of working. And you know, I won't go into the details here, but clearly one's more of a public health preventative approach one's more of an individually focused treatment approach. Um, but they're not disconnected. They're actually two sides of the same coin. And we shouldn't try to separate them out. Let's work out how we can join them together to achieve maximum benefit. But to have such a system, we need certain building blocks, which are currently absent. First and foremost, we need dedicated and recurrent funding. I mean, we find this very hard to, to unpick because there's very poor data. But we estimate that less than 1% of the federal government mental health budget is spent on prevention. I mean, that's not going to achieve anything. That's too little. Um, we also lack the leadership and governance structures that support a planned and coordinated whole of government approach. And, you know, in Victoria, they've recently set up a, an office for mental health and wellbeing promotion, which is going to be dedicated to developing initiatives to promote wellbeing, prevent mental health conditions. WA has got something similar in its uh, mental health commission. We need something like that at a national level. Of course, we need better delivery systems and those systems need to be in the settings where the risk and protective factors emerge. You know, the places where people are born, grow, work, play, live, et cetera. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. No one sector can do all this on its own. And somehow we need to get organizations from different sectors to work more effectively together um, in particular, I would say the public health sector and the mental health sector in particular. 
a workforce. I mean, who's doing prevention? I mean, we're, we've got a very clear public health workforce, all the epidemiologists and, and uh, you know, infectious disease specialists who helped us through COVID, you know, and all the uh, people working on um, active living and, and healthy um, eating, et cetera, and, and quit smoking. But where's our mental health promotion workforce? I, I, I can't really identify uh, such a workforce. And then we lack the data and information to track what progress we're making on these risk and protective factors because our tracking is more geared towards mental health care outcomes than population level outcomes. And of course, we need a steady stream of research and development. So my prevention scorecard, which is very you know, loose uh, and based on a, on a tick system, three very good, two good, one basic, one poor, et cetera, I would say, look, we, we do have interventions, probably more for protective factors than for risk factors, more for certain age groups than for others, more for some settings than others, but, but they are there. And, you know, but the problem is we're not able to implement them and translate them and have them available to scale uh, to achieve the impact. And, and why? It's because we don't have a national plan. We don't have those whole of government structures, uh, governance structures, all that leadership. Um, we, we don't have all the delivery channels we need or the workforce we need, and we don't necessarily have all the data uh, or research, but what's really killing us is we don't have dedicated and recurrent funding. So what's holding us back? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of things, I guess, but um, I would argue, firstly, prevention is complex, you know. Um, you know, taking a public health approach, you can prevent skin cancer by just tackling one risk factor, UV exposure. To prevent depression and anxiety, it seems like you need to tackle multiple factors simultaneously. And that means that we need, you know, to manage this complexity, That's whether that's through better co coordination or maybe just focusing on one condition at a time and starting, for example, with depression and making that happen to scale or, or a particular risk factor. Um, but it, indicated prevention is also difficult. It's no panacea. Because, you know, there's limited predictive value of screening tools, there's a lack of treatment options, and it typically requires specialised clinics or clinicians, um, and there's the stigma issues, as we've said. You know, research in this field is, is complex. You, you need large numbers to, to see change, particularly at a universal level, due to, you know, relatively low base rate occurrence. You know, to do it properly, you really need to screen out uh, for current uh, conditions and even a past history, but that requires a diagnostic interview and that's not always feasible. You need to collect data on the risk and protective factors, the symptoms, and, and potentially even about positive measures like wellbeing measures. And obviously you need to have a control group wherever you can, and not just receiving no treatment, but maybe an active intervention. And critically, you need long follow-up you know, a minimum of 12 months. Otherwise, how do you know you prevented, you know, the condition that might just come around later? Um, but that makes life hard. So what's holding us back? I think there's um, not enough groups and universities working on primary prevention. There's a live, there's premise, there's the prevention hub. There's also a lack of collaboration between people working on the risk factors like child maltreatment and intimate partner violence and people from a mental health research background. And I, critically, I think we're not targeting the single most important risk factor with any degree of system and certainty, and that's childhood trauma. That's a big failing. Um, and also the limited research that goes to prevention worldwide, estimated to be 7% of all mental health research, not just research. Um, the public, well, they're not familiar with prevention. And um, many might think that, look, that's genetic, it's biological, it's inevitable, there's nothing we can do. Our public health messaging has been about illness recognition and help seeking rather than about staying well, preventing problems. There's a normal human tendency to just deal with it when it happens. I'll wait and then I'll take some action. And as I said, stigma. At the sector level, I, you know, I get it. There's enormous pressure on mental health care services. And of course, they're focused on funding and reforms to fix the mental health care system. But that means they don't necessarily get out there and advocate for prevention. And as I said, I think there's sector fragmentation and a lack of these really high profile prevention champions. But at the political level where I think the biggest problem is, 
there's skepticism about the evidence, concern about how long it's going to take to reap benefits, you know, the, the difficulty funding mental health outcomes through other portfolio areas. And at the moment, there is no plan, there is no framework. You know, the National Preventive Health Strategy and Child Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy offer a little glimmer of hope, but, you know, it wasn't put into the recent National Mental Health and Suicide Agreement and Bilateral Agreement. So hard to know if it's going to happen. Just conscious of the time, I, I, I'll go through these very quickly. I believe there are some, you know, proven ways to prevent conditions or risk factors and even to promote mental well-being, some with more evidence than others. You know, despite the complexity, we're showing many positive results. There's a growing number of prevention-focused studies and there's some green shoots in government policy. But, you know, even with our best in, in, in interventions, the effect size is modest, the benefits wane, and I believe there's an overemphasis on some factors like psychological skills building and un underemphasis on others like social disadvantage. And when the rubber hits the road and we take the research into the real world, it's not always well implemented and therefore we're not necessarily getting the benefits that we saw in, in research trials. And why? It's because we lack the systems infrastructure for a public health driven approach, but we also lack the mechanisms for individually target ind indicated prevention. There's no MBS items for sub-threshold symptoms there's limited marketing and uptake of online programs, and there are very few indicated prevention specialist clinics. So what can Alive do? Well, obviously, as a research group, you can make sure that, you know, we, we pump out more and better research, improve the quality, tackle the under-researched areas, make sure that we're translating research at the coalface in the settings um, to increase uptake and quality, build the capacity of the sector, train more people in prevention research, increase the number of people working in this field, and then build those bridges with those other um, sectors like primary care, public health, and the community sector. And finally, join us in lobbying the government for better planning, coordination, and funding. You know, we need to create a mental health promotion system that complements our mental health care system, and we need to rebalance funding at the moment, 1% of the mental health budget is spent preventing mental ill health, 99% on treating mental ill health. We've seen from the data, it's not getting us to where we want to get. We believe that we need to grow the overall pie, but then reallocate so that at least 5% is spent on promotion and prevention, like the public health people are calling for in the physical health round, and 95% on mental health care. Um, so that's the talk, and very happy to to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Steve. That was fantastic.